think the more we can start to push this agenda to current fellows that um, going to, I would say, these rural areas, not technically rural, but um, to service the population is definitely needed to improve access to care. And I think with my background of going from Indiana to Birmingham, Alabama to Boston, I've seen all different types of populations, cultures, and um, it's not very shocking to me to be able to practice in a place that um, may not be the most conducive or liberal um, to um, reproductive health, um, but feel comfortable being able to provide that care that's needed. This episode was brought to you by My Egg Bank, the premier network of donor egg banks. Enhance your clinic's fertility services with My Egg Bank. By joining our network, your clinic can broaden its horizons, offering aspiring parents a diverse range of fresh and frozen donor egg options, each backed by our demonstrated success rates. Together, we can bring the joy and hope of parenthood to more families. Discover the benefits of partnering with My Egg Bank by visiting myeggbank.com slash IRH. That's myeggbank.com slash IRH. Today's advertiser helped make the production and delivery of this episode possible for free to you. But the themes expressed by the guests do not necessarily reflect the views of Inside Reproductive Health nor of the advertiser. The advertiser does not have editorial control over the content of this episode, and the guest's appearance is not an endorsement of the advertiser. Exponential impact. As a graduating REI fellow, as a young fertility doc, as any fertility doc, you're going to have an impact. Could that impact be magnified if by no other factor than where you live in practice? I explore that concept in my conversation today with Dr. Zachary Walker. He's a third year REI fellow, and he's not moving from Indiana to Boston. He's going the other way. Zach talks about what he wants to accomplish in practice, to promote diversity among patients, providers, and outcomes, to do research in those areas, and to help to launch an REI fellowship in a state where one currently doesn't exist. Consider that for a second. It's one thing to say that we need more REI fellowship. It's another thing to say, I'm going to move to this area and try to start one in this specific location with this specific institution. We talk about that. What's the difference between saying we want broader access to care versus actually providing broader access to care? We talk about the proportionality in income to cost of living for REIs in big cities and REIs in small cities. And we talk about a relationship between the clinic and the lab, which might either be really complicated or might be a totally new and beneficial way for REIs to diversify their business interests. This conversation was a lot of fun. If you're recruiting REIs or if you're an REI looking for the next chapter, I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation with Dr. Zachary Walker. Dr. Walker, Zach, welcome to the Inside Reproductive Health Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Griffin. This is amazing. I'm happy to be here. Finally, I get to talk about a topic that I've probed at different times with graduating fellows, with younger docs, with some of the execs, uh, where I'm really curious about how we expand access to care geographically. I'm from a small city. I live in upstate New York. There's lots of Buffalo, New Yorks, and lots of, you know, Akron, Ohio's and lots of Indianapolis, Indiana's. And uh, and it seems to me like 80% of the graduating REIs go to 10 or 20 cities. And uh, maybe it's not that uneven of a distribution, but it just seems like there's a lot of people going to the Bay. There's a lot of people going to New York and Boston and LA. And uh, it seems like that the smaller markets uh, are not getting their fair share. And so when we talk about access to care, we talk about a financial level. Can people pay for it at a technological level? Uh, it, uh, the demographics that we're serving, all valid pillars of access to care. The geographic one, I think, is really important because until we all live in the metaverse, <laughs> you got to see people in your area. So, uh, and and I was when when I ran into you last, and you told me that you were going to uh, practice in the in- Indianapolis mm-hmm. area after fellowship. Uh, I thought, well, maybe this is the guy to talk about this topic with. So yeah, let's just maybe, to, to you're, you're a third year fellow right now. Yep. Mm-hmm. And, and so you're going to practice in the Indianapolis area uh, next year. We're recording right now in January yeah, of so in 24. June, I started in August of this year. Yeah. So w- tell us about how this came to be. 
Yeah. So it was somewhat of a, I would say like a roundabout journey. Um, initially, my thoughts were to, as you kind of alluded to, most people stay in kind of bigger cities um, during fellowship. So my plan was to stay academics and I was going to stay at um, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, where I am now in, in fellowship. And then things started to happen with um, my family. Both me and my um, partner's family are both um, older, so they're getting sicker. Um, so we and we also wanted to build our family. So it seemed that staying in the Boston area may not be the most conducive to the, our future as far as a family building and being able to be there for our family because both of our families are very far away from Boston. So um, I interviewed at different places. So I interviewed back at, at my residency at University of Alabama in Birmingham. I also interviewed um, at um, Indiana University, which is the academic institution in Indiana, and then also the private practices in Indiana as well. And then um, before um, I um, moved from Boston, I also interviewed at the private practice in Boston um, CCRM. So um, initially, um, my plans were to stay in the academic kind of realm. So I interviewed at Indiana University School of Medicine and um, their uh, school there, does, um, they don't have a um, IVF lab. So um, they are partnered at the time when I was interviewing at, with two different private practices to send their residents to get the experience with IVF. Um, and as a referral base, which one of them being Midwest Fertility Specialists, which I've signed with, and then another one being Indiana Fertility Institute, um, which is really close to um, the Midwest uh, Fertility Specialist Practice. So I interviewed at both, and they both had their um, kind of pros and cons, but ultimately, I think we'll get to this in a, in a little bit, but the Midwest Fertility Specialist Practice just felt more like home and um, really um, felt comfortable moving into that realm after fellowship. So that's where I've decided to move forward after fellowship and um, continue learning and growing in that um, space. There's a lot of people that live in Boston and places like Boston where places like Indianapolis are nowhere in their narrative. How, <laughs> how readily did you accept this and just say, okay, you know, you know, my partner's from here, and so I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm down. Or how much of it was like, uh, like a, a pill you had to swallow? Tell, tell us about that. Um, it was a very easy pill to swallow. I mean, I did medical school in Indiana, um, so. I was familiar with the terrain. And if you ask any of my <laughs> friends from medical school, they are very shocked that I'm coming back to Indiana because it was um, <laughs> a very cold environment and I didn't see myself being there for a very long time. But then I met my um, now partner and I started to fall in love with the area more and more. And most of my mentors from medical school are still there. Um, so when I interviewed, it was like coming back home a little bit. Um, so the... Uh, foresight of me being back in Indiana has um, become more clear. And I feel like, as you alluded to before, the need is still there as far as REI um, in terms of um, how many providers are in the area. Basically, the Midwest Fertility Practice and the Indiana Fertility Institute are the, the biggest two groups there serving this IVF need. So patients are coming from all over the state um, to get their IVF um, in that area. So I think the more we can start to push this agenda to current fellows that um, going to, I would say these rural areas, not technically rural, but um, to service a population is definitely needed to improve access to care. And I think with my background of going from Indiana to Birmingham, Alabama to Boston, I've seen all different types of populations, cultures, and um, it's not very shocking to me to be able to practice in a place that um, may not be the most conducive or liberal um, to um, reproductive health, um, but feel comfortable being able to provide that care that's needed. So when you say cold, do you mean culturally or you mean like it's like it's chilly, oh, like it's cli chilly. <laughs> climate wise, it, yeah. it's a cold place to be. So you uh, you had this experience from medical school. Did you meet your partner in medical school in Indiana? Yeah, so me and my husband uh, met when I was a medical student in Indiana. He works; uh, he was working as a uh, <laughs> in a restaurant as a bartender, um, and we met. Um, and then things just kind of took off from there. And he's been on this whole <laughs> residency training journey with me since then, <laughs> moving with me to Alabama, then to Boston. So yeah. Had you met in Boston or somewhere else, and you hadn't ever had that experience of living in Alabama, of living in Indiana, but 
particularly Indiana, because that's where you're going mm-hmm. back to. Would you have considered it as readily? I think I would. I, I, the appeal of being in a big city, I mean, it's nice because of just the fact you have things to do and kind of a um, accessible place. But definitely, I grew up in a somewhat of a small town. I grew up in Hampton, New Prince, Virginia, which isn't like a big city. It's filled with military families and um, pretty much a lot of people know one another's close-knit community. So the attractiveness of moving to a big city wasn't really top of my priority list. Um, Mainly, I just wanted to be at a place that would allow me to continue to grow um, and allow me to feel comfortable um, to practice and to live and build a family. Um, And that was the most important thing. So uh, regardless of where we met, I think I would have still considered moving to smaller cities or outside of the the, like the major network. <laughs> I appreciate the distinction that you're drawing between smaller cities and rural because a place like Indianapolis is rural to someone from LA. But in the grand <laughs> scheme of things, like I lived in the in the heart of South America in the country, two and a half hours from the city, and I had to hitchhike to the road to get to the to the main road to hitchhike again to get to the, the closest small town, right? Like there's rural and then there's just yeah. small cities, cities, which yeah. is which is like what an Indianapolis or a Buffalo is or uh, a whole lot of places that are Tucson, Arizona that are really, really nice to live. Um, and I think it's important distinction to make because Unfortunately, the patient population that it does live in the rural areas is still driving to those small cities to to the provider in many cases. Like there are there are some people that are out in North Dakota and they're they're going to really you know rural areas, but for the most part, you know, uh, when we talk about these small cities, we're talking about places that. Sorry, you're going to have to take a connecting flight to to ASRM when it's in New Orleans. I know that sucks. Like, I want to take a direct flight, too. Uh, but, you know, you, you lose out on your direct flights. You lose out on the, your three-star Michelin restaurants. You, 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 um, but for the most part, in, in you, you talked about this in the beginning, where your interest is in... Ha- building a family and having a family like you're a busy provider you're gonna be a busy husband and dad you, like how many three-star michelin restaurants are you going to in a month anyway like you'll go there when you go to new york you know like i will go to the nice restaurants when i'm in toronto and la and uh and then in the meantime i'll just be a dad work out uh, and work my tail off and then not have time for anything else anyway. So Correct, um, correct. <laughs> I, do, do you think about this, though? Do you think about what amenities you're giving up and what amenities you're, you're, you're getting from the big city to small city move? Yeah, I mean, we've been in Boston for the past three years, and me and my husband, we, we go out, but it's not like an often thing. Like every weekend, we're not going to like see a show or going to explore the city. We are very much homebodies, and that's just me personally. So I can't speak with everybody that <laughs> lives in a bigger city. But giving up those, I guess, amenities isn't a, a big deal because, like you said, there's you're um, there are always going to be times where you're going to go on vacation or you're going to go out and make time to do those things that you really want to do, and they're they're not something that I do on a regular basis. So. Uh, I, I mean, I think some of it might be a little bit overrated for me, but uh, <laughs> the small city to big city life is probably going to be very much the same in terms of what I access and did on a regular basis. <laughs> and there are some people that I know, I've talked to some REIs that they practice in Midtown Manhattan and they live in Midtown Manhattan. And that walk through Midtown is part of their day. It's like part of their essence. I get it. There are some people who having access to those amenities is really part of their life. I think for 80% of the folks who who often cling to that, it's it's like, you know, how often do you really use it? And uh, when you're a top one percenter, as most of the people listening are, or at least a top five, for, top 10% earner, it's like, you can do that whenever you, you want. Like, especially... Have did you look at like the delta in between, um, you know, what REIs are making in in some of these coastal cities and what they're making in in some of the smaller cities, and then and then also the delta in cost of living? Like they're not how equal are they? Like yeah, it's 
I so I've looked at some of my other colleagues um, who have in my year who are um, have signed and moved to different cities. Some of them are moving to like smaller cities, like um, um, I think some people were considering moving to places in Tennessee um, and or places like smaller cities in Texas. Um, and definitely, the cost of living is the part that that is the kind of gets you as far as like the sign on bonus that they may offer you or how they do their bonus structure and living in Boston, like coming from Birmingham, Alabama, where me and my partner had a house, our mortgage was like, <laughs> like in the $500, then moving to an apartment in Boston, spending, spending over like $3,000 for an apartment. It's crazy insane, but definitely you get that inflation in your salary that makes it seem like, Oh, I'm making a lot more money. But most of that is coming out of your paycheck every month that you would have had um, to use to spend if you were in a lower cost kind of uh, city. So I think the contracts or the salaries that are being offered are pretty comparable, like throughout the states in terms of what an REI makes coming out of fellowship. Um, but as far as like the bonus structure, the sign on bonus may be a little bit higher for like bigger cities because they know if. That if you're coming there and like moving stipends and um, signing on for an apartment or wherever you're going to live, needing like first, last and um, uh, uh, for that lease. So it's a little bit different from that standpoint. But I think overall, the the base salary is very similar throughout. Welcome to a new era of fertility solutions with My Egg Bank, where your clinic's potential to aid aspiring parents is limitless. Our extensive and diverse donor network, including both fresh and frozen egg options, provides your patients with a wide array of choices, ensuring a personalized approach to their journey towards parenthood. With My Egg Bank's track record of success in both fresh and frozen egg cycles, your clinic is not just offering services, but hope and a real chance at realizing dreams of family. The difference with My Egg Bank lies in our commitment to quality and success. Our state-of-the-art reproductive technology and pioneering practices in egg preservation set a new standard in fertility care. By partnering with us, your clinic will not only expand its service offerings, but also enhance its reputation as a leader in reproductive health. Together, we can achieve higher success rates, increase patient satisfaction, and most importantly, be part of countless stories of joy and new beginnings. We invite you to join hands with My Egg Bank. Together, we can make the dream of parenthood a reachable reality for many. Visit our website at myeggbank.com IRH and receive our complimentary starter kit of resources. This carefully curated package is your first step towards revolutionizing your clinic's fertility services with My Egg Bank. That's myeggbank.com slash IRH. My impression was that it wasn't proportional, though. Do you, do you think it is proportional? Like, so that, that the cost of living is so much lower in the, in the smaller cities and the salary isn't that much lower relative to that gap. But you, th you think your, your read is that it is more proportional? I think it's more proportional. From what I've seen most recently among my year, I mean, maybe it has changed um, recently, but most of the um, salaries are very similar, like from Texas, Indiana, uh, to um, uh, Pennsylvania, um, and some places in um, um, Boston. I think the salaries are... And this may also be with like private versus academic because academic has their kind of salary base here from everybody who's signing for an academic position versus if you're in private practice. I think the gaps between what people are being offered is between $50,000 to $100,000 different. Um, and it, which to me, well, I guess it depends on, uh, I would, maybe I'm assuming erroneously, but it seems like you could get. Uh, a house in in suburban Indianapolis for six or seven hundred. What would be two and a, two and a half million in suburban Boston? <laughs> Correct. I, so, Correct. <laughs> um, maybe some parts are proportional and some parts are are less so. Do you think about ways of of being able to win the trade off in different areas? Like one of the reasons why I started remote work long before COVID was because I'm from upstate New York. I wanted to stay in a small city in upstate New York. I wanted my money coming from the, the 
to be more comparable to the larger markets. And I wanted to win the trade-off. I wanted to have that lower cost of living, no traffic, nice quality of life, but also have that career opportunity that comes from being in a much larger area. And uh, I think that may have been more difficult for docs to do even 10 years ago, but now with the opportunity to, uh, as networks buy practices, and then you could buy, you could buy equity into that network, and you can sit on a seat for that network, or you could be a medical advisor board for any of these new fertility tech companies that are emerging. Like You can do that from anywhere. You can do it from San Francisco, or you can do it from, from Boise, Idaho. Um, do you think about those opportunities? Yeah, a, a little bit. I mean, uh, I would say starting fellowship at Boston and having that network, I've been able to um, connect with a lot of interesting people and have a lot of interesting opportunities I presented to me as far as um, like I'm being an author for up to date, um, sitting on the ASRM committees um, and then doing some things um, outside of that realm as far as mentorship. Um, and then also um, talking to researchers in the Boston area as far as collaborating research for new technologies that are coming out, um, as far as like sperm research and analysis, which is my kind of niche in male factor infertility, um, and being involved in that either like remotely or actually doing hands-on stuff. So I do think that wherever you are, you can get involved, especially when you're going to these conferences like ASRM and meeting all these different companies that are selling new products and helping them with research or innovation. Um, and you don't have to be in a big city to do that. Um, but I think the biggest issue is that um, what is your prerogative uh, after fellowship in terms of are you getting off the train, as I say, uh, <laughs> in terms of academic research and just focusing on like quality of life, private practice, taking care of your patients and not really um, – focus on research as, as much anymore and just wanting to be a normal working civilian in a sense. Um, or if you're still um, ingrained in it and want to do research, then you might want to pick an academic job where you can focus on that and not have the constant drive or push to uh, bring in patients for like IVF cycles and um, have that revenue coming through and you can focus on other things and expand that. So I think the as you mentioned, the opportunities are endless. If you're interested in them, they're out there. You have to seek them out, um, and it may be a little bit tougher if you're in a smaller city or um, not in a uh, collaborating with a big academic institution. Um, but if you have that interest, it pretty much only takes an email or a talk at a conference to get involved. Now that you are moving towards this next part of your career, what is it that you want to accomplish when you're practicing? A couple things, I would say. The biggest one is um, mentorship. So uh, my biggest thing is that I want to make sure that we continue to expand the amount of fellowship slots that we have available to, one, expand the supply for the demand that's needed in IVF or REI in America right now. And I think ASRM is currently tackling that by um, discussing expanding the, um, the amount of uh, slots at each institution and growing that so that we have um, that kind of chain or flow coming through every year. And then there are more institutions getting REI practices. One of my goals while I'm at Indiana is to hopefully be able to foster or create a REI fellowship with the um, Indiana University School of Medicine um, and partner with them to be able to create a fellowship because they have pretty much every other fellowship but the REI one. Um, the second thing I want to do is uh, make sure that we continue to uh, promote diversity within the field of REI. Um, I'm involved with um, the health disparity SIG at, in ASRM, and then um, I'm also on the education committee at ASRM. And one of the focuses are diversity in the field um, as far as um, patient care and also um, advocacy and who's taking care of these patients. I think I was on a meeting with a couple other diverse REI <laughs> physicians, and we're just thinking back to how many people are of color or um, underrepresented physicians are out there in REI, and I think it's probably less than 20, um, you know, and how many patients are of underrepresented trying to find us or looking for us in the field, and, and most of us are probably in bigger cities. So we need to expand a little bit more um, to 
smaller cities or other places so that they can still find us or be represented in a sense and feel comfortable coming to their provider. Um, but you're actually willing to do it. I want to stop on that point for a second, Zach, <laughs> because uh, we 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 work in a field where that tends to you know go one way just in terms of general. Uh, I guess dis- ideological disposition or political disposition, and uh, and people say the right things, but then whenever ASRM's in Baltimore, people are like, "Oh, Baltimore!" <laughs> it's like, it's like, really? What, what's wrong with Baltimore? <laughs> yes, what, agree. What's yeah. wrong with what's wrong with <laughs> Buffalo? What's wrong with Cleveland? What's wrong with Detroit? Oh, okay. So I get, I get it. I get it. Like I grew up in these types of places, and and you got to have a, a certain, uh, you you got to be able to, to to say like I'm good with living with, uh, with less of amenities and or or just different ones and um and having a, a trade off in amenities, but but it's like you you can't say that. We really want equity. We really want equality, and then do something that that yeah is, that doesn't go part, in line with is, that yeah yeah that is, that is part of moving away from the mean. But you're so you're actually doing it though, um, and so like do you like do you, does that play into your head? Like do you think of like like are you the type of person that's like like. F everybody else, I'm actually going to do it? Or is it just like, no, this is where my husband's from and I think it's a good thing to do? Like, do, does any of that chip on the shoulder play in, it, play in your decision making even a little? I, I, I don't know if I, I would like turn myself as a trailblazer and like uh, say like, oh yeah, F everybody else, I'm just going to do what I want to do. I mean, there are some days I, I do feel like that when I'm working and I just want to like, like be my own boss. But I think everybody, every fellow feels that way. <laughs> but um, no, I think we do need those leaders who say, hey, we know that it's a need and I feel comfortable doing that or providing that and not feel like I'm going to be going out of my way because everybody has different backgrounds, experiences, family concerns, family um, needs that don't allow them to be able to take those steps, you know, and I'm not trying to say that we all need to move in this direction, but I do think we need to make it feel less, um, uh, what's the the best word? Uh, more comfortable for fellows to um, do that and not feel like they're being judged about not going to like a bigger practice or joining a bigger company because they're not getting a bigger salary or being able to be a partner at here or there. And I think it's, I mean, the future of REI may be moving in that direction where everybody's joining these big practices and they're expanding. And that's the way that it's just going to be after fellowship that you just join one of these groups. But I think that we need to have fellows feel more comfortable that you don't have to follow this trend. You can pave your own path and do what you feel is best for you. And for me, going back to Indiana and being able to serve this population, create opportunities for other fellows, create opportunities for the residents that are there and for REI and train them, that's perfect for me. That's that's always been a goal for me. So it just seems like a probably like a perfect fit. <laughs> I also think that establishing a fellowship is a very meaningful, measurable to to point to and say, I either did it or I didn't do it. And uh, right now there are states, uh, there, there's plenty of states that don't even have uh, a fellowship. There's no fellowship in the state of Arizona. University of Arizona doesn't have one. Arizona State doesn't have one. Um, does, does the state of Indiana have a fellowship right now? Not in REI. Um, so yeah, it's a, they have like definitely the private practices, but no fellowship and Indiana university, it's a really great residency program. So it's, uh, they've had one in the past. Um, but just over the years it got lost and I think it just needs a little bit, (laughs) some time to come back. That would be an exponential benefit, Zach, if you can pull that off, because you're not only bringing one REI to that state yourself, you would be, you'd be bringing, well, at, at least three in a given year, right? Plus the, plus the faculty, so maybe four, and then maybe every one, every, you know, four years, one of those stays, stays in, yep. in the area. And so you, you could have an exponential impact. How, how do you think you might get that done? So I think right now, uh, my goal is to try to see what the tone is between my practice Midwest Fertility Specialist and Indiana University in terms of like partnership or if there are ways to do that. Because you hear of other hybrid 
REI fellowships like RMA New Jersey or RMA New York that are with a big institution like um, Thomas Jefferson or uh, Mount Sinai. And they're able to have a fellowship through their kind of private practice, but it's affiliated with an academic institution. I don't know exactly how that conversation starts or the kind of the build begins, but I, I know Dr. Piper, who is the chair of um, Indiana University's OBGYN program and had conversations with him when I was interviewing for um, to stay at um, IU. Um, so I'm hoping that through my time there, being able to teach the residents and being able to uh, take care of patients, that we can start to talk about how we can structure a, um, a fellowship program. And I've reached out to some mentors who are doing it recently, and I know there's a lot of paperwork that comes with it, a lot of logistics. Um, so I don't think it will be easy in terms of um, getting it started. But I believe when I spoke with my current my future partners at Midwest Fertility Specialists who are interested in doing that. Um, and then also I, the uh, residency program director at Indian University, um, Dr. Scott, would also be interested in trying to get a fellowship started. So I think the interest is there. We just need to um, hit the ground running and try to get it started. I want to go back to um, the topic of where of how you sussed uh, out these interests when you were looking at different programs and applying to different programs. But I did cut you off a bit when you were talking, and I just want to make sure there weren't any other core objectives that you mentioned. Uh, you want at, hoping to add a, a fellowship, wanting to. Um, uh, improve mentorship and also promote diversity. Uh, and any other core objectives that you're thinking about for how you want to practice? Oh, um, so I like the last thing for me is I still like to do research and I'm hoping to continue that um, even in kind of being in this private demic center. So um, I'm currently mentoring one of the Indiana University residents, I'm hoping the best for her when she applies that she matches, but um, trying to increase the research that they have available um, in terms of REI um, at Indiana and then also within my practice, whether it be like IVF techniques or um, kind of racial disparities care, um, whatever kind of niche I can grow into. And the fact that when I interviewed at this place and told them my interest, they were also willing to help me with research and were going to give me the space to do that. Um, and I didn't feel that I was going to be like pigeonholed into just churning out IVF patients um, was a big thing for me to know that I wasn't going to have to give something up readily when I signed this contract and they were willing to work with me in whatever facet um, or space in the REI world um, to make sure I felt comfortable um, joining the practice. And I think that's a big thing. And I didn't feel like I got that everywhere I interviewed. Um, so when fellows are going out to speak with all these different businesses and companies and they're telling them, well, this is what your job's going to be. It doesn't that doesn't need to be the end all be all. You should kind of seek out what jobs are going to work with you to make sure you're not um, uncomfortable signing this contract. You know, you want to make sure you're getting into a job that's going to continue to expand your mind, expand your thoughts about the world of REI, um, and provide you satisfaction. So how much of the uh, the interview process was informed by having these objectives ahead of time, and how much of ha uh, the interview process formed your prioritization of the objectives? I would uh, looking back. That's a good question. I would say looking back, it was probably fifty fifty. So one of the things I do want to kind of highlight or bring attention to is that. As a REI fellow in our first year, you go to ASRM, you have, <laughs> once they know you're a new fellow or you're starting off, you'll get all these pulls or emails of what, <laughs> where do you want to go after you finish? What jobs are you looking for? Are you interested in this? We have these opportunities and it's overwhelming. Um, and you don't even know <laughs> what you're doing as a first year, really. You're just trying to figure out what it is to be an REI, but yet you have all these job opportunities coming to you left and right. And there's a some somewhat pressure to make sure you're not missing out on an opportunity because that's how we're trained as like residents or um, and medical students. We're very like type A personalities who don't want to miss out on something. So you get all these inv invites and you may jump into interviewing places early before you even know what you really want. 
And so I fell into that trap a little bit and interviewed probably at the beginning of my second year. And I, they were asked questions of, what do you really want to do when you <laughs> come out of fellowship? How do you see your schedule? What do you think is the most interesting to you? And I really didn't know 100%. So um, it didn't start until late my late second year, beginning of my third year to where I really knew, okay, this is how I see myself in the future of REI. And this is what I want to give back and had more meaningful conversations during my interviews about what I wanted and what they can offer and how we could find common ground to do that. Uh, we should feel comfortable working, um, kind of signing contracts um, at a place that, you know, that is going to foster your ideas of what you want to do as an REI um, coming out of fellowship and also what they would need out of you. Um, so it takes some time to develop those that knowledge, well, it did for me, I don't know for everybody else, but until my third year, I did, really didn't know 100% what I wanted to do. Um, so I think the more uh, time people take to really reflect about their thoughts of their future practice and see what is out there before jumping into interviewing would be my best piece of advice for any future fellows looking for jobs um, to not feel stressed about um interviewing and missing out on certain opportunities and take time for yourself because the need is there. There will be jobs available, um, but don't feel rushed to sign something so soon um, before you really know what you really want. Sometimes general advice for determining who you want to be in this world involves outlining what you don't want to be. Did, was there any of that? Did, did you consider ahead of time what you wanted to stay away from? Yeah. Um, and part of this did change a little bit um, because of all the stuff with my family that was going on. But um, initially, I never thought of myself working in like a private practice that didn't have research available because that was such a big part of why I was interested in REI, why I wanted to be an REI fellow was because of the, inter the research was very interesting to me. So I always thought of myself going into the academic kind of space um, to continue that. Um, and when I was interviewing and uh, talking to different places. This privademics model or this hybrid model um, was very enticing to be able to say like, hey, I would still be able to um, um, make a meaningful salary and also um, do IVF, but still have the ability to mentor, do research and train the upcoming REIs for the future. Uh, was like a perfect fit for me. And then this opportunity at Midwest Fertility Specialist and um, collaborating with IU seems like an even better deal. So um, having that space, kind of headspace of what I really wanted to hold on to was important. Um, and knowing that I didn't, I wasn't going to sign a plate to a place that was going to make me give that up. How did you suss that out? Because in interviews, people generally, especially when they're trying to recruit, uh, you know, they're not, uh, they're not the, they being clinics and networks are not the beneficiaries of the supply demand imbalance. Typically, they are typically trying to, everybody's trying to get their hands on an REI for the most part. And so, <laughs> uh, so, you know, people very often be like, oh yeah, you could do that, Zach, sure. And, and then it's like, when it actually comes time to do it, um, you know, people find out they weren't specific enough in their negotiation and and then they tend to fall back to, well, you know, maybe later or no, that's not what we meant or not now or whatever it might be. And so uh, how did you suss that out of, of, of who could provide you with what you wanted the most? So I part of it was... Um talking to other fellows um, ahead of me who've signed contracts with those those companies or who knew someone who's working with them about what their day-to-day -day was like and if uh, what I was being told was true or not. Um, and I think that went a very long way to have someone on the inside know what is their day-to-day. -day. Are they actually able to do research? Are they actually doing surgeries as much as they thought they were doing surgeries or how much of their day is literally, no, you need to sit down and see new patients and bring in as much IVF volume as possible. Um, so I'm very grateful for the people I know and like my network in the REI field from my co-fellows to um, prior graduates and keeping those uh, friendships close. Uh, another part of it is my practice that I'm joining isn't part of one of the big conglomerates. Well, not yet, hopefully not anytime soon, but it's not part of the, like one of the 
big five or whatever. And I think that is what allowed me to know that they were, I would have more wiggle room to do things um, because this practice has been in play for over 20 years and they have seen the shifts of all the different REIs um, in the state and um, can provide me with background on what's possible, what's not possible. And um, they felt very comfortable in my goals and my dream for this, for the practice and what I wanted to do. And um, I believe them. Um, so I think those two things really played in hand to make me feel more comfortable signing the contract and moving forward with them. So it, it, they're not part of one of the networks yet, as you say, but how many, how many docs are there? Four or five? Right now, there's five. I'll, yeah, I'll be number five. You'll be number five. So that's that's a group that one of the networks <laughs> wants to buy. So and, <laughs> and I've I've seen this before. Is that I've recommended. I've I've helped uh, connect some fellows with their future jobs, and then you know, it's an independent practice. And by the time they start, it isn't. And so, uh, have you thought about? what it will be like being in uh, a, a city right where, right now where there's like two, maybe three programs if you go further out um, versus, you know, if, if you are in uh, a, a larger city, if you're in the Bay Area, you know, if, if it doesn't work out at this place, uh, you know, you can go to one of 12 other places. Um, and uh, in the meantime, you might have, if, if it doesn't work out at, at a particular place in a smaller t- city, uh, you got your kids in school, you, you bought your house and it's like, gosh, do we have to like uproot and, and go somewhere totally else? Like, like, how do you think about those terms or do you just try to push it out yeah. of your head? <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of the latter for sure. Just like, just like everything should work. Um, but yeah, uh, in residency, we had these, um, kind of career talks about how often do people stay at their first job. And it's not <laughs> that high. Usually most people will leave within the first three years of their first job because of not liking it or things that were promised were not there. And, you know, that definitely may happen to me. Um, but um, definitely trying to be as optimistic as possible um, is kind of <laughs> my my headspace. Um, but, if it, yeah, if it doesn't work, you know, it, I will most likely have to move because of the um, – uh, contract of uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Non compete. Yeah, non compete. Yeah. Um, so um, that may require me to move um, or not be able to practice for at least a year um, before I can sign again, which would be definitely very difficult. Like the biggest um, network of potential jobs would be in Chicago, which definitely has a plethora of REIs. Um, but I'm kind of remaining optimistic <laughs> moving forward with that and hoping everything works out. I mean, I love the people that um, have met um, for my future job and they all seem very great. They all um, are very supportive of me. So I'm just hoping it all works out very well. Well, it's also part of when you want to do something meaningful, there's a certain amount of risk involved. I want to go provide access to care somewhere. It's a hard thing to do, which is what makes it meaningful. And hard things have risk attached to them um hopefully uh that uh it's win-win for everybody um and uh, i mean, if you think about do, do you want to like buy into the practice do you want to do you want to own equity with whoever you're working for or do you like not having to you know have those business obligations where do you stand so I do have a goal of yeah, being a um a partner with the practice I'm with so that uh is one of one of the interesting things that uh, drew me to the practice a little bit more um, was that they do have a partnership tract, um, which I think some of the um, bigger companies may not offer that anymore for a few, um, incoming uh, providers, or it's not the same as what other people got in the past. Uh, so because there's not as many of them, <laughs> like there's just yeah, there's not as many of those types of. Pra- I mean, there's different types, and they might be good too. But you know that old like I I buy in early, I get some equity, and then I'm part of right. uh you know I put my sweat equity in so that I'm the beneficiary of a larger share of financial equity later because I'm not buying it at a discount. And, you know I'm not I'm not discounting my future profits now. Um, so it, that it, that might. It is kind of, I wouldn't say unique, but definitely less common opportunity than it used to be. But so sorry for my commentary. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, that I mean, that's right. So the practice that I'm working with now, just um, they are uh, the lab is separate from the clinic. 
So the clinic um, has just been bought out by a group called Axia. Um, um, and even though the branding is um, different, the Axia Women's Group is partnered with Midwest Fertility Specialists. Um, so they are um, um, recently kind of renewed um, contracts. Um, and that's when I kind of came in and I'm under this contract with the new group. So, um, the so they are the other- they are part of a of a bigger group, but you're just saying they're not part of one of the the major fertility yeah, networks, like CC, yeah, oh, okay. like CCRM, so, okay. RMA, yeah. But the, yeah, they are part of a group. Yeah. So the and prior to me um, being there, they were part of a, another small group. I forget the name of it. So this turnover to Axia was a happened in the past year. The lab, on the other hand, is um, a part of the Ovation Network. Um, of um, embryology labs and IVF labs. So the ability to kind of buy into both of these uh, practices is uh, possible for me doing the partnership track. Um, and I mean, it would make sense for me to, to join um, um, right now from a financial standpoint, if I can, um, to work to be a part of that for future wealth. But um, that wasn't always the goal. The goal was mainly for the kind of academic research, mentorship, ability to create something um, new for the REI, um, like REI Fellowship at Indiana, um, which is my primary goal. The whole kind of financial things that come with it are definitely a bonus, but they weren't going to make or break the kind of uh, deal with me signing with them. I can't wait to interview you in five years again and do a follow up <laughs> of this conversation because I wonder if that is what what kind of path that will be uh, having the two different opportunities with the two different companies, one owning the lab, one owning the clinic. Because often you know, we've seen the ovation model before, and often the clinic will stay independent then, and the ovation owns the lab. Then USF acquired ovation, and so many of those clinics that were independent, many of them still are, those that uh, then decided, oh, I want to sell the clinic later on, I think would sell to U.S. Fertility. Um, so, you know, same parent company still. I think of uh, Houston Fertility Institute originally had sold their lab to Vivera, which then was acquired by Prelude and then uh, you know, became part of the inception. Uh, yeah, group, and, network. And then, uh, but then later on, it was Prelude that, or either you know, one of their brands, Aspire, that bought, I don't, I don't know exactly, that bought HFI. So still, again, still, mapping up to the same parent company right now, lab clinic for you, two different parent companies. I wonder if that will be complete chaos and you'll hate it or you, uh, or what I'm hoping, what I'm hoping for you, Zach, is that you are on the, uh, that you have tapped into something like, uh, the record labels or the content producers who are on different streaming services like South Park, you know, is still on this streaming service. But then for these specials, they'll they'll be over on Paramount Plus, and they can do they can do it, and they're benefiting from the different from the different labels. And some artists can I'll make this content over here, but when I do my crossovers or I'm with as yeah. a solo artist, I'm over here. When I'm with the band, I'm over on there. And when we do a crossover, you know, there's a there's a benefit, and they're a little bit more diversified as well. So I'm I'm hoping that this, that's the case for you and that you have, yeah we'll see you, it definitely you pioneered new, yeah. something <laughs> <laughs> we will see definitely i'll yeah check check back with me in five years <laughs> might have a little bit more gray hair <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how do you want to conclude, Zach, about either about uh, uh, expanding access to care, either by geography or or any other measure or any of the subtopics that we covered today? How would you like to conclude? Yeah, I, th- I think it just have kind of three main points. One, for any future fellows like listening to this podcast who are in the midst of looking for jobs or thinking about starting inter- the interview process, I would say take time to reflect um, don't feel rushed to sign contracts or push to do that. As, um, and definitely make sure you're having meaningful conversations when you're interviewing so that you um, feel comfortable signing the contract and um, can move forward with that process. Um, the second thing is um, for future fellows as well, this is your time to see if you want to get off the kind of academic train and um, go private practice or continue on and finding like a hybrid model or moving towards um, just working like a, in a private model and um, making uh, 
patient care memorable and taking care of your family and uh, moving in that um, aspect. So uh, this is a pivotal moment that we've never had before in terms of this isn't a match process. This isn't a um, put <laughs> an algorithm. This is literally your opportunity to pave the way for the rest of your future. So definitely take advantage of that. Um, and then the, definitely the last thing is um, we do need to expand our um, access to care and uh, making fellows feel comfortable moving to smaller cities or other areas um, to be able to provide that care. So hopefully um, this interview would make other fellows who are interested in that endeavor feel more comfortable in doing so and seeking out opportunities um, for themselves to be able to grow in their space. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Griffin, for having me on this show. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> that, that's my pious hope. Your, your, your wish at the end there, Zach. That's my pious hope. I haven't really been able to do it, so I'm hoping that giving you a tiny me megaphone is able to do it more. Dr. Zachary Walker, thank you for repping small cities. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. <laughs> this episode was brought to you by My Egg Bank, the premier network of donor egg banks. Discover the benefits of partnering with My Egg Bank by visiting myeggbank.com slash IRH and receive our complimentary starter kit of resources. This exclusive offer provides a glimpse into how we can enhance your clinic's fertility services and streamline the partnership process. Join us in making a meaningful impact on the lives of aspiring parents. That's myeggbank.com slash IRH. Today's advertiser helped make the production and delivery of this episode possible for free to you. But the themes expressed by the guests do not necessarily reflect the views of Inside Reproductive Health nor of the advertiser. The advertiser does not have editorial control over the content of this episode, and the guest's appearance is not an endorsement of the advertiser. Thank you for listening to Inside Reproductive Health.